Presented by Caltech. Good evening. My name is Tom Sofer, and I'm the uh, chairman of the Division of Physics, Math, and Astronomy. Um, I always think of this as the best part of my job getting to introduce the uh, speakers who are going to talk about their exciting research uh, that they do within PMA. And I'll tell you a little secret. The reason it's the best part of my job is I get to enjoy hearing about what my, the faculty are doing. Uh, so uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to remind you that the next uh, Watson Lecture will be on November 19th by Woody Fisher, the professor of uh, geology, and his talk will be entitled Photosynthesis, a Planetary Revol Revolution. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, David Shea, who is an assistant professor of physics. David works in experimental condensed matter physics. He received his bachelor's degree from Stanford in 2003 and his PhD from Princeton in 2009. After a postdoctoral appointment at MIT, he joined the Caltech faculty in the fall of 2012. David explores phenomena in the strange quantum world. He studies materials that exhibit unusual properties as a result of subtle collective properties of quantum fluctuations. In, he create, David created tremendous excitement in the world of condensed matter physics when, as a graduate student, he discovered the first topological insulator. This is a material that in bulk is an insulator, but on its surface is a conductor. Aside from its fundamental significance for physics, this work holds the promise of revolutionary technological advances. David has built an exciting research program here at Caltech to explore and understand these exotic quantum states of matter. In addition to his superb research, David is an outstanding teacher. After his first quarter teaching the junior level quantum mechanics course here, I received a note from one of the students in his, in his class explaining what a wonderful uh, teacher he was and pleading with me to ensure that he continued teaching the course. I won't tell you what the outcome of that was. Uh, David is also committed to bringing the excitement of science to local schools. He and his group teach an interactive class at Pasadena High School uh, on leading trends in science, emphasizing how the concepts that students are taught in the classroom are applicable to solving current important problems in science. Tonight, David will describe his research in his talk entitled Quantum States of Matter in Crystals. He will take uh, questions informally after his talk. So after his talk, those of you who have questions, please just come down to the front and, and talk to him. Okay, with that, let me uh, introduce David Shea. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. And um, let me first say thanks to all of you for deciding to uh, take a night off from your regular activities and take an hour to learn about quantum states of matter and crystals. So a state of matter, or equivalently a phase of matter, uh, is a concept that is used to describe what happens when a collection of particles comes together. And it's a concept that says that when a collection of particles comes together, their behavior and their identity as a collective unit actually overshadow and indeed even uh, render irrelevant what happens to them on an individual level. Just like groups of people can form communities and cultures, the sum of the behaviors of people that comprise this culture um, often creates a collective identity that becomes independent of what goes on at the individual level. People as part of a culture can come and go, live and die, but the concepts that underlie the community and the culture uh, stay timeless and indeed transcends the happenings on these individual levels. So just as people can form different types of cultures, groups of particles can form different phases of matter. <clears throat> 
And perhaps this fickle nature of particles uh, is nowhere better illustrated um, than a scene from the Alaskan Bay. So a simple lowly H2O molecule that's simple and nondescript on its own, when bonded together in large groups, can form phenomena as strange and as different as that that differentiates the water that flows in the pools of the bay to the structures that are rigid and strong enough to reach up into the skies, to the ethereal clouds of vapor that you see in the background. So it sort of begs the question, you know, what is the difference between phases of matter? What distinguishes one phase of matter from another? Well, one answer might be gotten if you start to look at the microscopic nature of the molecules that comprise these phases. Ice, for example, is made up of a collection of water molecules that form a regular, ordered, periodic arrangement in space. Water, on the other hand, is comprised of the same molecules, but in this case, they flow randomly over one another. And certainly, the symmetry is exhibited by the collection of molecules that form ice, and those symmetries that are exhibited by the collection of molecules that form water are vastly different. So maybe it's the symmetry between ice and water that defines the difference between a phase. But let's look at vapor for a second. In vapor, the water molecules are also randomly distributed and randomly flowing about one another. And in fact, the symmetry properties of the water molecules in vapor are really equivalent to those in water and liquid. So maybe symmetry alone is not a sufficient ingredient for distinguishing one phase of matter from another. Well, as unpalatable as it might seem to you, maybe the best way to define and differentiate one phase of matter from another is simply to say that something drastic happens to the collective properties as you go from one to the other. When you transition from ice to water, for example, the rigidity that characterizes a solid structure is lost. When you transition from water to steam, for example, the property of being incompressible that a liquid beholds is lost when it goes into vapor form. Now, transitions between phases can happen as a function of a change of some environmental condition. The case we're most familiar is probably temperature. As you raise the temperature of ice, you go through two phase transitions, sometimes what we call critical points. These are the, the critical points relevant to H2O happen to be the familiar critical points we encounter in the form of melting points and boiling points. So what does it mean to try to understand phases of matter? Well, basically, we as scientists want to devise some theory that enables us to predict not just the properties of these different phases of matter, but also where exactly these critical points lie, both so that we can better understand the fundamental laws that govern systems comprised of many bodies, but also because we want to exert some degree of control over them. For example, if you wanted to shift the critical temperature for some technological application, we'd want to know how these things work. So you might start from a microscopic level and attempt to model the interactions between two water molecules. And we can do this to some degree of detail. However, as soon as you transition from two to three water molecules, and indeed try to explain how a glass of water works, you're dealing with a model that has to take into account interactions between of order 10 to the power of 25 different molecules, and that's just not feasible. So our job as theorists is to come up with models 
that capture the essential phenomena while retaining the least number of details. And our job as experimentalists is to reveal more and more of nature, more and more of the properties of H2O, so that these theories can be better constrained. So one of the ways to unveil further properties of H2O is rather than just look at what happens as a function of temperature, we can consider another external condition we can vary. So at ambient pressure, where we live, the critical temperatures uh, lie at these two points, 0 and 100 Celsius. But if you vary a pressure, for example, these two critical points will shift, like so. And if you begin to collect these pairs of critical points over a wide range of pressures, these critical points merge into what are called critical lines or phase boundaries. And we can define the distinction between phases as being the need to, trend to, to uh, traverse one of these phase boundaries. So we can say that a solid is different compared to a liquid because to get from one to the other, we had to cross a phase boundary. Now, of course, staring at this phase diagram, it sort of begs the question whether vapor and liquid are different after all. In fact, if you define the difference between phases as the need to traverse a phase boundary, then I can simply go around this point and go from vapor to liquid without crossing one. So it's arguable that liquid and vapor are actually the same phase. Sometimes this is called a fluid. One thing that's quite remarkable about the H2O phase diagram is that this phase boundary that separates the liquid and vapor terminates at a point called the critical point. And strange things happen around a critical point, namely that if I were to cool the vapor into the liquid phase through the critical point, as I approach this critical point, what happens is that puddles of my substance that exhibit these liquid-like properties begin to grow larger and larger and begin to fluctuate slower and slower. Now, we might think that the solid phase is all one single homogeneous phase. However, if we consider properties in addition to things like rigidity, in fact, if we look at solids with x-rays or we take dielectric measurements, for instance, what you find is that the solid is actually broken up into very many pieces of different phases. And in fact, ice is not as simple as you might first think. In fact, there are many phases of ice. We happen to have first-hand experience with what's called ICE-1H, because that's the pressure and temperature range human beings are accustomed to being exposed to. But if you cool ICE-1H down a little bit further, it turns out you go into this ICE-1C phase. The difference lies in their molecular ordering structure. Here's a schematic of what ICE-1H looks like at a microscopic level. The water molecules arrange themselves in this hexagonal pattern, which gives rise to the six-fold symmetry of the common snowflake. ICE-1C, which is realized at a slightly lower temperature, crystallizes in a cubic structure. So if one day, the Earth temperature dips below our current comfort level, we might see square or cubic snowflakes raining down from the skies. So phases of matter you've seen already um, can emerge from interactions between collections of identical particles. But rather than talk about molecules, my wish tonight is to have you consider the possibility that phases can also arise by putting electrons together. So let's sort of decompose the structure of a molecule first. The H2O molecule is made of oxygen and hydrogen atoms. And each atom is composed of a positively charged nucleus around which negatively charged electrons orbit. The electron has both a negative charge However, it's got another property called spin. 
And you can think of spin as an intrinsic magnetic moment with a north and south pole that's attached to every electron. And this spin can either be oriented up with north pole up and south pole down, for example, or it can be oriented down. There are two possibilities that the electron spin state can be in. And that'll become important as this talk progresses. So let's consider ripping electrons off molecules and putting them in a box and asking what happens to their collective behavior. Do they form interesting phases on their own? And right away, you can probably say, hey, if I take electrons and put them in a box, they all have negative charge, so they're all going to repel one another. So they're just going to fly to the edges of the box, and nothing special is going to happen. And that's absolutely right. However, if I can convince you that of this art of somewhat artificial situation where I've embedded a collection of electrons in a homogeneously positively charged medium, such that the positive charge exactly balances out the negative charge, rendering the entire system neutral, um, then the situation is not so clear. In fact, it's known that at high densities, where you have a lot of electrons per unit area, um, the electrons can actually form a liquid phase, much like water molecules form a liquid water phase. And in this phase, sometimes we call the Fermi liquid, the electrons are free to flow around one another. And the Fermi liquid is how we characterize the flow of electricity in metals, for example. Now, if you consider, rather than changing temperature, decreasing the density of the electrons in this medium, what was predicted by Eugene Wigner in the early 30s is that there's also a critical point. There's a phase transition that occurs. Oops. And this phase transition takes my electron liquid and crystallizes the electrons. So the electrons, in fact, form this triangular lattice. Sometimes we call this the electron solid or the Wigner crystal. And so this is sort of the first indication that electrons, like water molecules, can also in undergo these phase transitions. So while this might seem like a somewhat artificial construct, embedding electrons in some gelatinous positive medium, um, it's actually been realized in the lab. Here's one of the ways it's been recently realized. What this group of experimentalists in France did is that they sprayed a sheet of liquid helium on top of some array of electrodes. And then they sprinkled the electrons on top of that film of helium, like so. And they microfabricated a device that consists of a trap where these electrons can enter and exit from, as well as a reservoir that contains a large number of electrons. Okay. And by tuning the voltage between these electrodes, they can force the electrons to enter or exit this trap. Okay. And what this group can do is they can count the number of electrons that are in this trap, and at the same time monitor the energy cost of putting in an extra electron or taking away an electron. Okay. At the same time, you can theoretically model what happens to the energy needed to remove or uh, put in an electron based on what the electron configuration is inside the trap. And from these kinds of measurements, they inferred that indeed at these low densities, the energy required to put in or take out an electron is consistent with the electrons in the trap forming a crystalline state. Now, there's a much easier way to create a system in which electrons swim in a background positive medium than sprinkling electrons on helium. And in fact, you encounter this situation in everyday life. This happens in crystals. You encounter crystals in the silicon chips that are inside your smart devices, uh, the quartz that's in your watches, the copper wiring that transports electricity to your home, are all examples of crystals. And crystals, of course, are macroscopically neutral objects. The char negative charge of the electron is balanced out by the positive charge of the ions that comprise the lattice of the crystal. 
Now, beyond those examples I just mentioned, crystals also come in different shapes, colors, forms, transparencies. Um, they're really quite a sight to behold. Now, when you consider electrons flowing inside a crystal, things get much more complicated. Okay? Because rather than interacting with a uniform, positively charged background, these electrons not only have to interact with one another, but they're constantly being bombarded by positive ions, by this lattice network of positive ions that, are, that make up the host. These interactions are very, very difficult to model. And in fact, a lot of the behavior of the electrons and crystals um, has to be deduced through experimental means. So the particular family of crystals I want to talk about today are a family of crystals belonging to the copper oxide family, or cuprates for short. Here are some examples of members of this cuprate family of crystals. Now, even though ostensibly they might look quite different, they all share one thing in common, which is, their, which is that they're composed of these two-dimensional planes of square lattices formed by alternating copper and oxygen atoms. This I'll refer to as the copper oxygen plane. So in this compound, for example, the copper oxygen plane sits here, once it's here, and this compound once it's here, 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 and here. And the difference between these different members of the family is really how these two-dimensional copper oxide planes are stacked. Okay? Some of them might have different types of ions as intermediate spacers, but overall they share this common property of having two-dimensional copper oxide layers. To give you a sense of what these things look like, they grow as beautiful single crystals. This is probably a few millimeters on a side and fractions of a millimeter thick. And this has remarkable properties, which I'll show in the next couple slides. So the particular compound I want to talk about is yttrium barium copper oxide. In this compound, you can vary the amount of oxygen that you put into the crystal. And as you increase the concentration of oxygen in the crystal, you actually remove electrons from the system. In other words, you can think of that as putting in more positive charge. Okay. So as I increase delta, the concentration of positive charge increases. That positive charge we call holes. And hole doping refers to the level of positive charge that I put into the system. So I can create a phase diagram, much like I did for H2O, and ask what sorts of phases can emerge um, upon changing my hole doping concentration and my temperature. So at this high doping end, electrons in YBCO form an electron liquid or a Fermi liquid. It behaves as a normal metal would. Physically, what's going on is that electrons live in, that live in these copper oxygen planes are free to flow about one another, much like water molecules do in a liquid. However, if you go to the low doping regime, a different phase is realized called the antiferromagnetic insulator. This phase, as the name suggests, is an electrical insulator. It doesn't conduct electricity, opposite to the case for the Fermi liquid. And this occurs because the electrons prefer to be pinned to the copper sites. They don't like to move around. And in fact, if you start interrogating this compound with other probes like neutron or x-rays, you can actually discover that the spins that are associated with each electron form their own ordered pattern. And in fact, the directions alternate from being up and down as you go from one ion to the next. And this is a phenomenon called antiferromagnetism, or AFM for short. So what else happens in this phase diagram? Well, it turns out that in the intermediate doping range, when I'm right between the AFM insulator and the Fermi liquid, I encounter a phase called a high temperature superconductor, or high TC superconductor for short. The properties of this superconductor are remarkable. 
First of all, if you measured the electrical resistance of this compound, you would find that below some critical temperature, which I call Tc, the electrical resistivity or the electrical resistance drops to zero. Exactly zero, not close to zero, but exactly zero. So it conducts the electricity absolutely efficiently. YBCO, I've picked in particular because it's the first member of this high TC cuprate family where the transition temperature has exceeded the temperature of liquid nitrogen. In addition to these remarkable transport properties, there's another property that's worth mentioning about this phenomenon of superconductivity. These measurements are performed by a technique known as nuclear magnetic, nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR for short. And basically what this technique measures is how much, how much the spin of an electron responds to an applied magnetic field. And so typically, if you apply a magnetic field onto a spin, the spin wants to align with it to lower its energy. So it responds to a magnetic field. But something very peculiar happens for the case of the superconductor. You can see that the response to the magnetic field, which is called the spin susceptibility, or chi, actually plummets to zero below the superconducting critical temperature. So whatever is responsible for carrying this superconducting current, whatever carrier is doing that is also insensitive to, to magnetic fields. It's almost as if the spin of that carrier disappeared. So these are very peculiar pieces of experimental data. Now, suffice to say that the importance of the discovery of high temperature superconductivity is evidenced by the fact that it was awarded a Nobel Prize the year after its discovery to Bed, Nords, and Muller. That same year, it made the cover of Time magazine. There were interesting prognostications that the future would be one of electric cars powered by superconducting circuitry. Now, ironically, we have electric cars today that have nothing to do with superconductors. Um, and of course, there's also perhaps the most obvious application, which is that superconductors can conduct electricity really well and maybe one day replace copper as the medium of choice for transporting electrical power from one point to another. And in fact, there's been a great deal of improvement in the synthesis of single crystals of YBCO to the point where now strands of this sort of dimension have comparable capabilities to bundles of copper wire this large. OK. So what's really going on to induce this phenomenon of superconductivity? Well, let's sort of look at the copper oxygen plane a little bit more closely. Like the Fermi liquid, the electrons in a superconductor are free to roam about the lattice. Okay, so let's focus on those for a second. But we also have a constraint that's been imposed by these NMR measurements, which is that the spin of whatever's carrying the supercurrent seems to vanish. And one way that can happen is if these electrons pair with spins in opposite direction. And so as a collective pair, the sum total of spins goes to zero. Okay. This phenomenon happens over large distances in the lattice. And it happens to all the electrons that are participating in superconductivity. Sometimes we call these Cooper pairs. Now there's something very special about the way the spins are arranged in Cooper pairs relative to what your intuition might tell you. And to give you a little bit more insight into the strangeness of this phenomenon, I need to make a little digression and introduce a little game. Okay? So let's imagine that I've got a blue ball and a gold ball, and I put one under either of two opaque cups. Okay? Now, before I even open the cups and reveal the color of the ball 
underneath each, you know that there are only two physical realities that are allowed. In one case, the blue ball is going to be on the left and the gold ball on the right. In the other case, the gold ball is going to be on the left, the blue ball is going to be on the right. And I'm going to designate these possible realities by the symbol psi. Of course, when I've revealed the color of the balls under the cups to you, immediately you can say that the reality had to have been this one. In other words, before I've shown you what color ball is contained in each cup, it was already in this reality. It's just that I didn't know it. This is something we call classical entanglement. By virtue of knowing the blue ball, I know that this cup has to contain the gold ball. And so in a way, they're entangled. And this is a very intuitive exercise. More non-intuitive is what happens when instead of a ball, you think about objects that are much smaller, where quantum mechanical effects become important. So rather than my two realities being blue on the left or blue on the right, what quantum me mechanics tells us is that before we've open these cups to reveal the color of the balls that they contain. The physical reality of the system is one in which the blue ball being on the left and the blue ball being on the right are both possible and are both in existence simultaneously. Sometimes we call this a superposition of the two states. Once we open one cup to reveal a blue ball inside, that immediately forces the other cup to contain a gold ball. And by virtue of that, we force the system into this reality. Sometimes more technically called that the collapse of a wave function. But the important thing to take away from this is that before I have knowledge of which ball is in which cup, the system is simultaneously in both. And this is something that we call quantum entanglement. And so if I go back to this antiferromagnetic insulator. This is an example of something that's classically entangled. The reality, or my wave function, is described by saying that the spin on this ion points up, this one points down, and up, and so forth, and so forth. In the Cooper pair that exists in the superconductor, on the other hand, the two spins are quantum entangled. In other words, the reality is that they're simultaneously in a state where the left electron is up and the right electron is up. This is a very, very strange phenomenon. But it dates back to a theory by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, who were awarded the Nobel Prize for um, explaining this phenomenon. In recent years, and especially at Caltech, the phenomenon of the quantum entanglement has featured strongly in proposals for building next generation quantum computers. Cooper pairs may be a good source of generating these entangled pairs. And in fact, there have been some recent experiments that have attempted to build components of a quantum computer by taking Cooper pairs as my source of entangled particles and attempting to split them over large distances while maintaining the entanglement property. So for example, one of the Experimental proposals would be to attach a superconductor to a pair of non-superconducting channels. This is called a Y-splitter. And the challenge would be to see if you can take this entangled pair, force one electron this way, force the other electron this way, while still maintaining quantum entanglement after they've propagated by a large distance. And this might be an important component for quantum computing. And in fact, um, such a device has been realized. Uh, based on semiconductor nanowires, more recently based on carbon nanotubes, where it's been projected that entanglement can actually be preserved even after these Cooper pairs have propagated over distances of microns. Okay. So that's the superconductor. But like the case of water, and like the case I mentioned where ice is not simply ice, but is made up of many phases of ice, um, are there other hidden phases in this phase diagram we don't know about? And in fact, um, there are many. So sort of sandwiched 
between the Fermi liquid and the antiferromagnetic insulator is a phase that, want for a better term, physicists would call the strange metal. And it's strange metal precisely for that reason. It exhibits properties that, um, that are hardly understandable by current laws that have been developed. However, one thing that's very interesting about this strange metal is that it's been proposed to be a highly entangled state. Okay. So whereas in the superconductor, pairs of electrons form entangled states, it's possible, and indeed it's been conjectured, that in the strange metal, these pairs of entangled states can in turn become entangled with one another, and then in turn become entangled with another pair, and so forth and so forth, forming a huge entangled mass altogether. And in fact, there's a very elegant explanation um, of this phenomenon um, that's been documented by this, um, documented this popular article by Sachdev. And even more interestingly, there are very deep connections between this sort of phase of matter and string theory. There's a lot, it turns out, that string theory can tell us about this, which is for another lecture. Now, one of the reasons uh, why this might be true is because of the following suggestion, which is that if I continue these phase boundaries that mark where the strange metal terminates, and just pretend that the superconducting part wasn't there, then these phase boundaries would actually terminate on this zero temperature axis to a point. They look very much like they would converge. And this is something we call a quantum critical point. Much like the classical critical point I described in water, except that we call it quantum because it occurs at zero temperatures, where quantum effects are very pronounced. And remember how I told you that when you transition from vapor to liquid across the, the water critical point, these length scales for our, these liquid-like uh, parts of your system become very large. In the same way, as you get near a quantum critical point, it's possible that the length scale over which entanglement happens becomes very large. And that's one possible explanation for this strange metal, but it's still under intense investigation. In addition to the strange metal, if you put your glance to the left, you encounter another very weird phase called the pseudogap. And I won't go into why it's called the pseudogap, but I will try to explain how this may be a phase of matter that's different from anything I've marked on the phase diagram so far. So in order to do that, let me say a few things about symmetry. So just like ice and liquid exhibited different symmetries, um, there's a possibility that the antiferromagnetic insulator and the pseudogap also exhibit different symmetries. And by virtue of that, they are classified as different phases. OK, so let's think about one symmetry first, where I reverse the direction of all the spins. It turns out mathematically, if you just reverse the direction of time in your equations, that's equivalent to flipping the spins around. And if I do that, clearly I don't recover the state I started with. And so we say that the symmetry of time reversal, or the symmetry of spin flipping, has been broken in this system. Well, in addition to reversing time, you can also think about reversing space. For example, if I ask what the system looks like as I invert space about this point, I can invert these two electrons, right? or I can invert these two electrons, and I do the same procedure for all the electrons in my system, and you can convince yourself that the system looks the same under the inversion of space. And so in this case, we say that the inversion of space is preserved. Okay? So these are the relevant symmetries of the antiferromagnetic insulator. And let me move on now to what happens in the pseudo gap. So it's been proposed, it's not been experimentally confirmed, but it's been proposed that the arrangement of magnetic moments in the pseudo gap phase looks something like this. Now instead of my spins pointing in the plane of the screen, they're either pointing out of the screen towards you which is denoted by this dot, or they're pointing into the screen away from you, as denoted by this crosshair. So take a second to convince yourself that time reversal symmetry is still broken in this system. 
if I reverse the direction of all my spins, it doesn't look like the original state. However, unlike the case on the left, if I invert space, it also looks different, right? Because I'd interchange this one and this one, and that wouldn't take me back to the original state. So this is an example where space inversion symmetry has been broken. And so the difference between these phases might be this breaking of, of spatial inversion symmetry. Now, this model of the cuprates, at least, hasn't been absolutely experimentally pinned down. But one thing we've been trying to do in our lab um, is find evidence for this phase in similar materials. So recently, what we've done, for example, is instead of use a lattice of copper and oxygen, we take out all the copper ions and put in iridium instead. And what we find is strong evidence that this phase can exist in these planes of iridium and oxygen. And not only do these phases exist, uh, we've recently done microscopy measurements uh, that have shown that as you cool a system below some critical temperature, so this is an image of this crystal of iridium oxide. As you cool the system below some critical temperature, this space inversion symmetry broken phase exists, and it actually forms patches. Right? It forms these domains, and we're still trying to understand why exactly that happens. But suffice to say that that certainly complicates experiments if these phases don't even occur in a homogeneous fashion over the surface of a crystal. OK, so that's the pseudo gap. Now, as our technology with regards to probing these phases has advanced, and people have started to look harder and harder into this phase diagram, they've not only discovered you know, this myriad of phases I've already mentioned, um, but it turns out other phases also pop up. Charge density waves, spin glasses, electron pneumatics. And it's become very hard, and indeed one of the big challenges of the 21st century, uh, to figure out which of these phases is important to superconductivity, which are not. Are there more phases that we haven't discovered? How are they related to the phases that we know? And do they have anything at all to do with this phenomenon of high temperature superconductivity? Until we answer that question, we don't really know the full potential of these copper oxide families. And we won't really know what really underlies the mechanism behind high temperature superconductivity. And in turn, we really won't know how to modify the material to make TC higher. Now, so far, I've only considered two parameters that I can tune, one being temperature and one being doping. But of course, there are other environmental conditions that I can vary. And one of the, one of the knobs that we're very interested in exploring in our lab is the effect of light. What happens if I shine light on a material? What does that do to the phase diagram? How does the phase diagram evolve under increasingly intense light impinging on the crystal? So I can draw another axis that I denote by light stimulation. And I can ask, how do these phase boundaries move? Can I use light to go from one phase to another directly without having to cross an intermediate phase? Or indeed, you know, more pressingly, can light actually create new phases of matter altogether um, that aren't realizable at equilibrium? It turns out to do these kinds of experiments, you need to have very strong sources of light. The power that's coming out of my laser pointer just won't suffice. So a laser pointer very typically puts out, let's say, five milliwatts of power. And it does so continuously over time. So as so long as I keep my finger on the on button, it puts out a constant stream of power. One way I can get high power is instead of spreading out my power over all time evenly, I can concentrate that power in short spurts in time. And indeed, if I make these intervals of time over which a laser is on shorter and shorter, you can see that all the power can be concentrated in these very short-lived spikes. In fact, commercially now even, you can buy lasers that produce 
this train of spikes with duration of the spike lasting tens of femtoseconds or even shorter. A femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And when you've squeezed all that power into such a short time, the effective power that you reap out of a pulse can reach of the order of 10 gigawatts, orders of magnitude beyond what you can reach with a laser pointer. So this is the type of equipment that we use in our lab to generate these high, intense pulses of light. This is what the laser, in fact, in our lab looks like. And the type of experiments we can do are run in what's called a pump probe manner or pump probe geometry. The way these work is as follows. So you take a crystal that's exhibiting a known phase of matter, and then you shine a very brief pulse of light on it, called the, we call the pump pulse. And this pump pulse serves to alter that phase of matter from one to another. And then after that pump pulse has done its job, we send a second pulse, which we call the probe, to interrogate the phase that's been induced by the pump. Okay. And so by measuring this probe pulse as a function of delay time between when my pump and probe arrives at the sample, I can build up a time trace of how the sample's behaving as a function of time after my initial pump pulse hit the sample. So maybe to make this experiment a little clear, you can bring your minds to stroboscopic imaging. In a similar way in which we can capture continuous motion by stacking together freeze frames, you can do the same thing with ultra-short pulses and electrons. So this is an example of data we've taken in our lab showing the intensity of this probe pulse as a function of time after an initial pump pulse has done something to the sample. In this case, nothing too exciting is happening. All that's going on is that this pump pulse has altered the energy landscape in your crystal. It's excited a vibrational mode of your ions, and that vibrational mode is in turn affecting the behavior of electrons. And you're seeing the effect of that vibrational mode on the electrons as, as these ripples as a function of time. So essentially, what we do in the lab is we make stroboscopic images of electrons, um, except we do so at a very, very short time scale, on the order of 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 15 seconds. But beyond looking at vibrational modes of lattices, um, it's been possible in recent years to do even more crazy types of alchemy. For example, it's been demonstrated in vanadium dioxide that you can prepare this system at room temperature as an insulator, something that doesn't conduct electricity. And if you shine a very brief and intense pulse of light on it, you can momentarily turn this into a decent metal. And this transition from insulator to metal is accompanied by a reconfiguration of my lattice symmetry. Moreover, it's been shown recently that you can take a member of this copper oxide family, which I've been talking about earlier, where the superconductivity has been suppressed. And by virtue of shining light on it, I can actually induce superconductivity to occur. So I can bring a phase of matter from a non-superconducting one to a superconducting one simply by virtue of shining light on it. And I think that's very remarkable. So throughout this talk, I have been discussing all sorts of electronic quantum phases that are realizable just by discussing compounds composed primarily of copper and oxygen. There's the rest of the periodic table to play with. And there's an infinite number of combinations that you can think to synthesize or in lab or mine in nature. And the types of phases that these different compounds might host may be beyond our imaginations. And many maybe beyond the current abilities of experimental techniques. So a lot lies at the horizon of, of this field. And one of the grand goals uh, is to see ever deeper and deeper what kind of phases can arise and what they might be good for, um, both in terms of telling us about the fundamental laws of many particle systems and also in terms of what they can do to advance uh, technological applications.
So let me bring you back to slide one. Hopefully, if nothing else, this talk has given you a glimpse into what happens when many things get together and conspire to form different phases of matter and the complexity that can arise um, through the power of the collection. Perhaps this will prompt you to look at glaciers in Alaska with a different point of view next time you visit. It's not just me at Caltech that's doing this kind of physics. In fact, there's a huge thrust at Caltech looking at different aspects of quantum phases of matter, electronic phases of matter, even classical phases of matter. It's become so popular, in fact, that we've recently um, become home to a center called the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter, or the IQIM, which is a consortium of physicists with interests that are similar to my own, researching these topics from all different points of view and with all different methodologies. And if you want to learn more about the happenings in this institute, I invite you to take a look at our website. OK, so thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have questions, please, please come up and ask. Thank you.